All right, guys, today is going to be an exciting video. We are putting together a Chevy Big Block, more specifically, a sixth generation Chevy Big Block, even more specifically, an L21 sixth generation Vortec Big Block. Now, most of the Big Blocks of the sixth generation came in the L29 configuration, which is what a one ton Silverado or uh, Suburban would have. The only real difference between this and that is that the L21 has a coil near plug configuration. So from the outside, it looks similar to an LS engine. And then internally, depending on who you ask, it has uh, forged internals with the crankshaft and the pistons. And then the PCM is a little bit detuned so that they last a little bit longer. Now, this is uh, relatively straightforward and relatively simple. So simple, in fact, I've got a three-year-old helping me. Give me five, Betty. So let me show you how I've got everything set up and how we're gonna get started. Oh, before I do that, there should be a little disclaimer here. I don't like doing disclaimers. I shouldn't have to do disclaimers, but don't mess up something and then blame me. If you don't know what you're doing, at least enough to follow along, you probably shouldn't be doing it. So that's it for my disclaimer. But you should try because this is really simple. All right, let's get, let's get going. All right, guys, this is how my short block is looking at the moment. You can see it has been recently rebuilt. I had Castle Engines out in Spokane do this for me. But this buildup will be the same even if you didn't need to have the complete short block rebuilt, like if you're doing just a cylinder head replacement or head gasket repair or something like that. As far as my cylinder heads go, I had these rebuilt by uh, Cylinder Head Services, also out in Spokane. I think they did a fantastic job. One of them had 11 thousandths of an inch uh, discrepancy on both edges. They called it a banana where it was bent kind of like that and it was actually so warped that the valves needed to be reseated because the valves couldn't make a good seal which is why I had low compression and oil consumption looking at the rest of our components here you see I've got all of the uh, lubricants and sealants required we've got the uh, Teflon thread sealant the ultra sick engine builder the anti seize we've got some PB blaster ultra gray and then some thread locker I also have my little pocket reference guide I'll show you what we'll need that in the future we have our oil pickup tube the oil pump we've got our cylinder head uh, bolts here along with our exhaust manifold bolts we've got all the moving parts including the rockers uh, the rocker studs which are actually shoulder bolts over here we We've got our valve covers, intake manifold, we do have the fuel rail with all new injectors, our timing cover. Uh, a lot of the big blocks use a polypropylene or polycarbonate one. This uses the aluminum one, which is very nice. Uh, we've got all of our Felpro gaskets, our flex plate. We've got our crank pulleys here, some of our knock sensors. We've got our distributor, and then we've got our oil pan. You can see it's all nice and clean. The guys at the engine shop went ahead and put all of these components through their wash tanks, so we are good to go. So let's just get building. Now we can start off one of two ways. We can either flip this over and start on the bottom side with the oil pump and the oil pan, or we can start on the top with the cylinder heads. There's no wrong way to do it. A lot of the guys will like to start on the top in case anything falls through here, you know, dust or contaminants. That way they can get it cleaned up before the oil pan goes on. But I'm going to flip this over because each cylinder head weighs 73 pounds. So adding 140 pounds to this makes it more difficult to swing around. And I'm not too worried about any contaminants coming in because I'm a professional. So let's do it. All right, guys, the first thing we are going to do is install the pump pickup tube onto the oil pump here. Now this oil pump mounts like so. It's got a couple of little dowel pins there and then a single bolt to hold it in. This surface is machined, so there's no gasket needed. You're gonna go ahead and get a finger tight and then snug it down with a 5 8 wrench. And then we are going to get the oil pump pickup tube. And then we are going to snugly fit it in there just by hand. This is a press-in style. At the factory, they just shoop, push it right in. And then they don't do anything uh, after that. But I will show you what most of the guys recommend. So I'll get the, make sure that the block is just dead level there. Let me get it right there. And then we'll make sure that the pickup tube is the same. We're looking for zero degrees on both. Little bit off right there all right and then we will go ahead and mark it on the side here now this is a factory setup factory pump factory pickup tube factory pan so we don't need to worry about the adjustable height that a lot of the aftermarket ones have now that that's all marked up we need to push it in like i said from the factory these are just pressed in most guys 
tack them with a little weld on the side here. That is what I'm going to do only because it is recommended by the shop that built this engine. Uh, because these are just pressed in from the factory, I'm quite certain that a press would hold. But like I said, I will do whatever is recommended by the people that know more than me. All right, so I've got it all marked up. I'm going to put just the tiniest amount of Loctite on here. And that's really more to act as a lubricant as I'm pushing it in but also to help seal it and hold it. All right, got our Loctite on. Now there is a special tool that is required for pressing this in, but I will show you a little trick if you do not have that tool or want to buy it. There. This is a three quarter inch wrench and then a 7 8 uh, oxygen sensor socket. So you slide that over right there and it basically makes the same tool that you would pay a lot for. And we're just going to go ahead and tap this in. Now sometimes they'll slide in a little bit easier. You see we still have about maybe 3 8 7 16 of a gap there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull this oil pump off and then we'll uh, push this on on a workbench because it's not recommended uh, to hit the oil pump with too much force. So let's get that taken off and we'll do it on the table. All right, so I've got the pickup tube welded to the oil pump. You see just that one little tack is all that's required. I started on the cast iron side with the welder, then moved it up to the pickup tube uh, because the cast iron requires a lot more heat to get it welded than the pickup tube does. The next step is going to be installing the oil pump drive shaft to the oil pump. You see they lock together like so, but there's still movement this direction. So the oil pump will come with a new collar here and you simply press the collar on between the two and there's a little ridge on the inside that locks in to the little groove on the metal. All right guys, I couldn't get a great shot of pressing that little plastic fitting on, but if you see with the light shining through, you can tell that it is on all the way. Next step is installing the oil pump. All right, we've got our oil pump installed. We have only a single bolt that goes right in there. Now they do recommend putting some 30 weight oil on here, so I'll go ahead and do that. Now this needs to be 65 pound feet, uh, and if there were two bolts here, I would torque them in sequence, and GM recommends that you start at 35, so it would be 35, and then 50, and then finally 65 pound feet, but because there's only one, it doesn't really make a difference. You're gonna just keep tightening the same bolt either way. So let me get some oil on this, and then let me get this to 65 pound feet. All right, guys, the next step is to install the oil pan, but I can't do the oil pan until I do the front cover. So I'm going to go ahead and install the front cover right now. Now, if you notice, these two little dimples lined up on the timing marks, this is not top dead center for cylinder number one. This is actually top dead center for cylinder number six. So if you see, I've got one cylinder right there that's at top dead center, and then I've got one cylinder right here that's at top dead center. This is number one, this is number six. On the big block Chevys, you rotate this 180 degrees so that it's lined up here and here right there, right there. That's actually top dead center for cylinder number one. Just something to keep in mind so that as I put this timing cover on right now, we will know that we are on top dead center for cylinder number six. All right guys, before we install the timing cover, I do have to install the camshaft positioning sprocket. Nice. All right, now we're good to go. Time for the timing cover. Now you're gonna see a little gap right here and it seems like you should put some sealant in there uh, before you put this cover on, but because of the dowels, it will end up just squishing it back. You actually apply the sealant there when you're putting on the oil pan. So like anything else on this engine that requires torque sequencing, we're going to be going in a cross pattern here and we're going to do it in three different stages. We're starting off with 30 pound inches and then we're going to work our way up to 50. There's 30. That's the same as a six pound feet. And that's because it is an aluminum cover. There we go, we're at 30, now 50. All 
I do love these gaskets that these use though. That uh, rubber seal that's pressed into the groove, those seem to last really well. Now, 72. All right, there we go. Now it's time for the oil pan. All right, before I put this oil pan on, I do have to put RTV in a few locations, mainly right here, right here, right here, and right here. That is recommended by Felpro and GM, but most guys who do this also put a bead across the top here, across the top here, and then again, once you put the rubber gasket on, at least a little bit right here, because that is the area that is most prone to failure, and I am no different. I'll put RTV in those spots as well. So let's get it squirted in there. I'm using Ultra Gray. Uh, I, I like the Ultra Gray and the Ultra Black. I've had a little bit better luck with the Ultra Gray over the years, so that's what I end up using. Now there's a little rubber lip that you've got when tightening down this gasket, and you want to make sure that that lip goes into the little metal groove before you clamp it down. Now there are 20 oil pan bolts. They are all the same. I know on the Fords they like to use a larger one on the ends. So you can have four that are bigger, but Chevy's all the same. I'm just going finger tight for now. Once I get them all finger tight, I'll come in with a speed wrench and then get them snug and then uh, come in with the torque wrench. Now before I go any farther, I just make sure that all four of these corners, the rubber is getting pushed into that little groove. Looks good. I'm using a 90 degree dental pick for that. Nice. Hey Betty, do you want to help me? You do? Come here. All right, let's get the torque wrench ready. I, it's perfect. I got the baby torque wrench ready to go. This one's from Grandpa Jimbo. This way. Baby Papa, Baby Papa, Baby Papa, Baby. Push. And then right here. Push. You did it. Give me five. The next step is to wipe this down and make sure there are no contaminants. There shouldn't be because it was wrapped up in plastic until this morning. And then getting the Felpro gaskets and then the heads on. All right, guys, time to install the head. Uh, you'll notice I've got very large water jackets here, but when we put the Felpro gasket on, some of them are closed up entirely, like that one right there, and then some of the other large ones are just totally restricted. Now, these are called water restrictors. That's exactly what they're designed for, to not let as much coolant pass into the head because a majority of the heat is going to be surrounding the cylinders. So just make sure that the gasket that you install is the correct one. I actually went back and verified when I pulled the heads off and looked at the gasket that was in place from the factory and it is the exact same gasket. So we are good to go. Why, oh why, didn't I go with aluminum heads? These are heavy.
All right, guys, it's time to get these heads bolted down. We do have two different sizes of bolts up here. These two spots are going to be the long bolts, and then down here, they're going to be short bolts. Most of the aluminum heads that you can get aftermarket-wise have three different size heads, and so you'll need to go with completely different bolts. We are reusing the bolts on these because they are non-torque-to-yield or stretch bolts. Those are one-time use and one-time use only. For this type of engine, I will reuse the bolts at least once. Uh, if the engine does have to come apart a second time, that's usually when I scrap them. But this engine shouldn't have to come apart for another quarter of a million miles or so. So I'm going to go ahead and put thread sealant on the ends of all of these bolts because they do penetrate into the water jacket and that will help keep any coolant from sneaking its way past it. And then I will do just a small dab of oil along the top of all of these where the bolt actually mates to the cylinder head surface. And the purpose for that is because as you're torquing it down, you want the torque wrench to be calculating the clamping force of the bolt. And if you have too much friction on the head of the bolt, that can put resistance on the torque wrench and then you're not going to get as much clamping force so that's not something that everybody does but it's a habit that I got into and has worked really well for me so let's get the thread sealer on these bolts and then get them installed uh, again just like any other torque sequencing you are going to start wherever it says number one is and then you're going to continue through whatever the torque sequencing is supposed to be on cylinder heads it's pretty simple basically you're going to start in the middle and you're just going to work your way out in a circle so it's one two three four five six and just continues all the way to the outside and then we're going to do it in three different stages. GM recommends, again, 35 uh, pound-feet for the first series, and then you work your way up. We are going to end at 75 for these long bolts and 65 for the short bolts. And I'm not sure if I've got two torque wrenches in that range, so I might actually have to keep going back and forth between 65 and 70 while I'm doing it, but we'll just see uh, as we go. So let's get to it. Check this out. Okay, this hole. Here, okay, you can, you can this use this hole. flashlight and look inside. You'll see these little valves. Do you see them? Yeah. What's in this hole? That's a valve. Betty, do you think you want to be a professional engine builder? Mm-hmm. Yeah? Or a race car driver? A race car driver. You want to be a race car driver? Uh-huh. Alright, so first thing we have to do is put just a tiny bit of oil on each of these little holes right here. Okay, I'm going to start handing you some bolts, and you're going to go ahead and put these bolts in, okay? You know where this one goes? Uh -huh. It goes right here. So I'm going to get it started for you, like that, and you're going to go ahead and start turning it, okay? Just like that.
All right, what are we going to be doing next? I did that. Okay, do you want me to tell you? <laughs> okay, we're going to be installing the entire valve train in the center here. And then uh, we've got a couple of retainers and then a cover. And then we get to install the intake manifold. You know what's going to be... my puppy! I am your puppy! You know what's going to be the most fun part? We get to install some push rods. Do you want to help me with the push rods? Uh -huh. Okay, let's go ahead and start getting them installed. Uh, first things first, I got to put on some rubber gloves. What? This is engine assembly lube. Will you go ahead and hold on to that? Now I am reusing the original lifters. I made sure to mark not only the location that they were removed from, but also the direction because they could be rotated 180 degrees. And when you're reusing the cam and lifters, you do not want to do that. If these were new lifters, I would have soaked them overnight in 30 weight oil. But all I have to worry about here is making sure to get a nice coat of assembly lube and then putting them back where they came from. All right, where does this go? Down. 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 Oh, you're right. You're fine. We did it. All right, guys. Up next is finishing up this valve train install, and there's a few different ways to do this. The easiest way would be to install all the push rods, the guide plates, the rocker arms, and then torque everything down as it sits, and you'd probably be good to go. The way I do it is a little bit different, and it starts with installing the harmonic balancer, and let me explain why. If you remember, when we installed these heads, I put a drop of oil at the top uh, where the head bolts meet, so that as the head bolt is getting torqued down, you're not measuring the friction between the head bolt and the head. The oil helps eliminate some of that so that the torque wrench is measuring the clamping force, which is really what you want. When we have the harmonic balancer on, we can verify that we're at top dead center for the number six cylinder, which means that the number six cylinders are both fully closed as well as the exhaust valves on numbers two, five, seven, and then the intake valves on three, four, and eight. Then, when we rotate it 180 degrees, we know we are at top dead center for the number one cylinder. Then we are also at uh, closed valves on the exhaust for, number, for numbers 3, 4, 8, and then the intake for 2, 5, 7. So with one 180 degree turn of the camshaft, we're able to get to a position where we can tighten down every single rocker when the valve is in the closed position. And what that means is when the torque wrench is torquing down the shoulder bolt, we're getting an accurate reading and not any of the resistance on that rocker arm. It's probably overkill, but to me it makes sense. Plus, when we're done, we are going to be at top dead center for the number one cylinder, which is exactly where we want to be for our distributor install down the line. So let's get to it.
All right, it's time to rotate the crank, but before I do that, I need to put in the bolt and torque it down. And before I can do that, I'm gonna use this, my special little tool. I made this thing like 20 years ago. You see, it's just angle grinder and a hole and a piece of flat steel. But I am able to screw it in like so, and then hold it in place while I torque it down. Most engines, I've got some type of a tool that'll hold the flywheel or flex plate, but we don't have one of those on here yet. So we'll do this to hold it down, and we'll torque it down. Now this bolt, like so many of the others, is required to be coated with a little bit of engine oil before you install it, and we will be torquing this down to 85 pound-feet. Nice. If you want to buy Austin's little helper, uh, call it Austin's Super Fan Clutch Remover 10,000. It is on sale right now for only 4,200 bucks. All right, now let's go ahead and rotate this until we are at top dead center on number one. All right, we are at top dead center again, this time for the number one cylinder. You see both the lifters are all the way down. Now let's get the rest of this valve train installed. Alright guys, I'm getting ready to torque down everything on the top dead center number one and I'm realizing I didn't torque it down when I was on the number six. So after I torque down everything uh, on the number one side, I'll go ahead and rotate the crank 360 degrees, the cam 180 degrees, tighten everything down, uh, torque everything down rather, uh, and then I'll rotate it back to get back to top dead center for number one so that we are in the correct position for when we put on the intake manifold and then the distributor. Guys, this is the last time we're going to see the inside of this motor, hopefully for a quarter of a million miles. So we should definitely sign it. And by sign it, I mean draw a little picture of me eating some pizza. There we go. Now I would not normally apply RTV to the cylinder heads in this application, but you can see there is a small amount of pitting on the cast iron right here, and that is almost certainly caused by the engine overheating and the coolant not being replaced at a regular interval. So I went ahead and applied a very thin bead, just enough to make sure that those pits are filled with the RTV so that the rubber can make a good seal against them and that we don't have any leaks in our water jacket. Now the two bolts in the front and rear of this intake manifold do penetrate into the water jacket, so I made sure to apply some thread sealant on those. The rest of the bolts just get a quick dab of 30 weight engine oil.
All right, guys, before I can put the valve covers on, I do need to prime up our oil pump to make sure that we are getting adequate oil flow to all of these rocker arms. Before I can do that, I have to install our oil filter, fill it up with oil. I did go ahead and install the crankshaft positioning sensor so that no oil dumps out of the front timing cover. And then back here, there's a little oil gallery plug that houses the factory electronic oil pressure sending unit. I don't install that initially. I install this. It's a mechanical oil pressure gauge. It's a little bit more accurate, at least for the oil priming and the initial startup. Uh, so once we do all that, we'll be ready to get this oil pump primed. So let's get to it. All right, guys, so we've got the oil in the engine. We have the mechanical gauge all set up. There is a special tool that fits in here to prime the oil pump, but I have misplaced mine. So I contacted Gavin over at Death Toll Racing to see if he had one I could borrow, and he did me one better. He gave me an old distributor that he had modified by removing the cam gear so that it can be used as an oil pump primer. And if you notice, there's a little key on the end here. All we have to do is line up that key down here with the key on the oil pump and then spin it clockwise, and we will be good to go. So let's get this thing pressurized. All right, guys, I'm ready to install the distributor on the Vortec engine. It's very simple. The rotor and the sensor line up right here for top dead center. You can see there's a little mark from when I disassembled it. But as it rotates on its way in, you're going to want to start off right where the opening is for that sensor. And then that way, as it slides in, whoop, it moves like so, and you end up at top dead center. All right, I'm just using a screwdriver here to line up the drive shaft on the oil pump right where I think it will engage. And we'll use a gasket there and then get this installed. Oh, got it. Nice. All right. Let's see. Can we line that up? Oof. It's over a little far. So we're off by a tooth. So as soon as it's off the tooth, we're going to rotate it, the whole thing. There it goes. Oh, now our drive shaft's off. There it goes. Oh, we got it. Nice. All right, we're all lined up. Let me get a little closer so I can show you. Right there. And then we look over here. Look at that. The hole's lined up for the distributor clamp. So let's get this tightened down. All right, time to get the thermostat and the water outlet installed. Now there's no gasket up here. It's sealed with the O-ring that wraps around the thermostat.
All right, guys, up next, we will be installing the spark plugs, which is very simple and boring, but let me see if I can make it complicated for you. We've got our torque spec guide over here, which shows the spark plugs going in with no lube or sealer at 20 pound feet of torque. Now, the reason they don't require anti-seize is because we have cast iron heads, and of course, the threads on the spark plugs are steel. So we have two carbon-based steels, no dissimilar metals. If we were running aluminum heads, we absolutely would require anti-seize to prevent galling. Now, just because anti-seize is not required on this setup doesn't mean it's forbidden. You absolutely can still use anti-seize on your spark plugs, but it will change your torque values. And that's where this comes in. My little pocket reference guide has an entire section on this, and it shows you how to multiply your torque settings depending on which type of lubricant or coating or sealant you will be using. And if you go over here, you will see a copper graphite based anti-seize. You are supposed to multiply your torque settings by 0 0.80. So that changes from 20 pound feet to 16 pound feet or 240 pound inches to 192 pound inches. Now I probably could just tighten this to the good old German specs of Gutentight and we would be more than adequate. But since we've got all the tools here, we might as well do it right. So I'm going to apply some anti-seize and get these torqued in. All right guys, this is as far as I'm going to take the engine build on the stand. Everything else will take place on the actual truck. So I'll go ahead and hook this up to the cherry picker and get it installed. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm installing this in a GM 6500 medium duty truck that I'm in the process of turning into a custom pizza truck. So if you wanna follow along with this engine build, that will take place in episode seven of the custom pizza truck series. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead and write those below. I do a pretty good job of staying on top of those. Otherwise, I guess that's it. Thanks for watching, thanks for making it this far, and take care. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.